so happy to be hosting this and hosting you. There are plenty of seats in the balcony, and so folks want to get a seat. The seats in the balcony are excellent seats. We have a lot of people sit there on Sunday morning, and they stay awake, which is a miracle in itself. We have restrooms all the way down the hall. We have two restrooms behind the sanctuary. Just don't stumble over any furniture uh, getting there. I also want to ask you, except for emergency personnel, if you'll take your cell phone and turn it off so we don't have the problem of cell phones going off, and I'm going to do mine right now. Just do that so that we have, we can take the other one, take them off. We're glad to partner with the city tonight. They will be uh, a love offering taking up, taking up the door. So you will, there'll be individuals who will have containers of what They'll have buckets at the door. This is a, a, an enormous feat, and uh, you help us by uh, making sure that you make contributions to keep this cause moving and going. I want to thank the folks of the city. I want to thank Kelly Cook for her work and what she's done in working with us. And a couple of our folks, Matt Long of Half Sound and Nick Milkey, who is working with the videos. And uh, he'll have all of that information and, and, and make all that work well. To our youth who are helping to do what they're doing as far as hosting all of you. This time I'd like to invite our mayor, Jim Byer. People come, let's welcome our mayor. Tina Meyer, this is uh, 
Her first trip to the great state of Alabama to promote this cause that is so near to her, and dear to her heart. She'll be in practice this evening. She'll be in several of our schools tomorrow. And then we'll meet with the governor tomorrow and uh, introduce Ms. Meyer to our governor and, and uh, actually tell Governor Ryan that her message and her story. So without further ado, Jessica, we're glad you're here and we're glad you came up with this program. Thank you so much. Okay, I'd like to start by thanking Mayor Meyer. Thank you so much um, for everything, for the city's support. Thank you to the city of Prattville the city council and to the community, all of you. Um, this platform wouldn't be what it is without you. It started as an acronym and it has just exploded into what you see here tonight. Um, so thank you. Thank you to First United Methodist Church. Thank you to Pastor Bill. Thank you everyone. Um, the biggest thank you I have to give, and then I will move on, I promise, is to my family. And they take up from like here all the way over here. So. <laughs> Um, my family is my biggest support system. They're the reason that I have the courage to stand before you today after what I've been through. And they're the reason that with taking full credit hours in grad school and working 40 hours a week, I can still stand before you with such a large platform. So my family is my biggest support system and my director and my board, they fall under my family, Michelle Hillman and Kathy and Teresa and Kelly Cook. They're all wonderful people, so just know that whatever I say tonight and whatever is going on with Karma is not just me. It's a support system. Karma stands for Kids Against Ridicule, Meanness, and Aggression. Karma was born um, because as a public speaker, I was invited to go to a school. And my platform at the time was breast cancer awareness. And that's not something you can talk to fourth graders about or fifth graders. They don't understand. So when I went to the classroom, I didn't really know what I was going to talk about. Before I walked in, the uh, deputy that I was with said, you look green. Are you going to curl up? And I said, no. She was like, why are you nervous? You're talking to thousands of people. I said, what if they make fun of me? She was like, well, you're 21 and you're 10. I don't think it's going to be good. So at that point, I didn't really realize how badly I had been affected by the bullying I had endured. Um, starting when I was about Seven years old, I started to get picked on for having too many freckles, and then it was for having strained hair, and then for being too short, which I still get picked on for. <laughs> if you guys come up close, I promise I'm not as tall as I look. Um, and then when I was about eight years old, um, a little boy called me ugly in front of the whole class. And at that point, I had never really looked in the mirror. I was in an age where the most important thing in my life was Barbies and coloring and the mirror wasn't something I really ever paid attention to. So after he called me ugly, I went home that day and I looked in the mirror and it didn't hurt my feelings. I was just like, okay, this is ugly. So that was my measuring stick. And I went around the rest of my days looking at people and thinking, well, do you look like me? Okay, you're ugly too. <laughs> <laughs> you don't have freckles, you're not ugly. <laughs> so, um, I just thought that that was like a fact of life. I accepted it. Um, and it got worse. And I was a cheerleader. And I hung out with a popular crowd. I wore the right clothes. Um, they used to invite people to parties and pass out invitations at school and give them to everyone around me and then tell me, well, you can't come. Nobody wants you there. Um, they invited me to parties that didn't exist. They would steal my books and my homework when it was due. Um, and it got to a point where I didn't want to go to school anymore. Um, I was a very good student. I liked to learn, loved to read. I was a huge geek. <laughs> Um, I made excellent grades. I always excelled in whatever I did, and I got the fun of that. And it was to the point that I wouldn't do my schoolwork and I wouldn't go to school. I tried to make my grades fail so that I could fit in. My parents, thank God, didn't let that happen. <laughs> um, and I just moved on. I wish I could say there was some moment or some wonderful thing that happened that made me get over it, but there wasn't. I graduated, I went to college, went to Auburn, God's country. Um, and I found my friends, I found where I belonged, I found what I was meant to do. I really dove into my studies. I really concentrated on being a college student. And I didn't realize until that day outside that fifth grade classroom that I was actually devastated by bullying. And it never hit me. So karma was born. And karma, the name, I chose because I believe that what goes wrong comes wrong. I believe that if you live your life as a giving, caring, kind, helping person, that you will never find a time in your life when you're in need that help will not be given, ever. And I always try to live by that. And the ability to make karma into an acronym for bullying was just 
<laughs> and since then, it has been more than a snowball. Snowball could not even describe what Karma has been. Um, I contacted the Megan Meyer Foundation because I remember I'm a news junkie. I watch the news every day all day. And I remember when Megan's story hit the news, and I was just devastated, personally devastated. And I kept thinking, that could have been me. That could have been me. How did I make it out when she did That could have been me. So when this started, I contacted the Megan Meyer Foundation, and I didn't know what I was looking for. I didn't know what I wanted. If they had said, yeah, we'll help. What do you want us to do? I would have said, I don't know. I just wanted to talk to somebody. Um, and the response I got was one of love and support from Tina Meyer herself. And I never dreamed that she, I would be able to bring her here tonight like I have, but I am so very thankful to have her. Um, she and I have grown very close, and I have made it a mission to end bullying in Alabama. I know about this website. I did not know about this website until somebody, like the mayor said, somebody said, oh, you're doing a town hall meeting for the website. And I said, what website? So I went and looked at it. And you can ask my mom. She got an email last night, as did Kelly. I have never, never felt the way I felt when I read that website. Ever. And to think that our young people think this of each other and would voice it is absolutely devastating to me. And that, it's, that right there is the reason that I stand before you. It's because when I was young, we didn't have the internet like they do now. There was no Facebook, there was no MySpace. When I went home, I got away from the league. I got to go home to my family where they loved me. I could go home and go play outside, play with my brothers and sister, and forget about it. And kids can't do that now. You leave school and log on to your Facebook and it's right there staring you in the face. You go on to MySpace, it's right there. And now you can go on campus gossip and it's there too. And this is something that has to stop. It has to stop. And the only way it's going to stop is if we do it together. You have to stop it. I can't walk on that website and make them stop. And I can't beg them to stop. And I can't shut that website down. And neither can you. You're gonna have, it, it's going to have to be a group effort to make them stop. And people have asked me, well, what's your advice with a website like Campus Gossip? Block your kids. The internet is so user friendly, you just Google it. How to block my kids from a website? And you can password block it, and they will never be able to see that website again on your computers. It is that simple. Nip it at the source. And what terrifies me is reading what was written on that site and seeing how frighteningly similar it is to what was written on Phoebe Prince's page. And for those of you who don't know, Phoebe Prince is a little girl in Massachusetts that committed suicide just a few weeks ago. And I'm pretty sure that the day she died, somebody walked by her at school and said, why don't you just go kill yourself? And then her parents had to delete her Facebook page because kids were still writing such awful things on her page after she was gone. It is my opinion, living under my personal principle, what goes around comes around, that we should be teaching our kids the type of generosity and kindness and empathy that would lead them to be the kind of people we are. <coughs> Prattle isn't the community it is by acting that way. Prattle is the community it is because we care about each other. This is one of the most loving and open communities I have ever met, and I know that our children are that way, and I would like for it to be reflected. So that's me addressing the website. We will have a question and answer session at the end or comments or anything. So if you feel like you want to say something, by all means, you will get the opportunity. Um, whenever I go to schools, and I am going to school some schools tomorrow, so some of you young ones that are here, you will hear this again. I always get the question, well, how do I deal with a bully? And I have developed what I call standing strong against, against bullying or standing strong for karma. Um, and STRONG is also an acronym, if you can't tell I love acronyms, it helps me remember things. <laughs> STRONG stands for say something, tell someone, respect others' feelings, offer a helping hand, never use your words to hurt someone, and give your best every day. And that is what I always teach students, to follow their steps to end bullying. You have to say something, you have to tell something, period. And as parents, it's your job to maintain an open line of communication. Part of the biggest problem with bullying right now, and the reason it's not been addressed, the reason there's not a major national organization, is because a lot of people don't believe it happens. 
Parents think, well, I got bullied, somebody stole my lunch money, they stole my notebook, they chased me after school, and I mean, it's just part of growing up. But now, with things like campus gossip, it's not the same. It's a lot worse. It's malicious and it's dangerous. And as parents, the best thing that you can do is be involved. My parents were so involved. My parents knew every single person I hung out with. First and last thing, knew their parents. We all were that close that if anything happened, I could say, Mom, so-and-so said this. And I had somebody to go to, and it could be taken care of because we had those open lines of communication. You can't shut your kids out because you think that you got through it okay, and they will too. It's, it's too risky because it is too bad now. Bullying has changed so much. And honestly, I can say that without my family, I wouldn't be standing up here today. Because what those kids did to my self-esteem is unbearable. Um, I went to teach D.A.R.E. a few weeks ago, and the school invited me to come eat lunch with my fifth graders that I was teaching, and I couldn't walk in the lunchroom by myself, and I'm 22. I was terrified to walk in the lunchroom by myself. And I still have a horrible fear of being made fun of, and I still, to this day, no matter what you do me, I cannot make other people feel bad because I know what that feels like inside, and I know what it's like to live with that. And as a parent, the hardest thing you will ever face, and this is what my mom told me, she said, the hardest thing you'll ever face is looking at your child and thinking that your child is the most beautiful person in the entire world and having them say, Mama, why am I ugly? Because that's what I used to ask my mom and dad. My mom said, we never thought you were ugly. We thought you were pretty. And I'm looking at my old school pictures, and I'm thinking, are you sure? <laughs> because I have to, uh, and yes, I get asked all the time, can we see your old school pictures? <laughs> I told you I don't want to get made fun of. <laughs> um, so yes, it does affect you. It affects you for a very, very, very long time. Words wound, and they, they stay with you. Not everybody is capable of letting things roll off their back. Not everybody is capable of letting words bounce off of you. Some people, like me, absorb it and take it to heart and hold it for a very, very long time. And I think that if there was any community in this state that I have visited or I have met or been a part of, they could start this rally to end bullying. Pratt was the place to do it. You guys are one of the most tight-knit, close, strong communities I have seen. And I think that together we can do this. And I want to do this. And after seeing campus gossip, I want to do it even more. And I know that parents do too. I read some of the things on there, and I know how you parents must feel reading this. I really do. And if kids will type that online, just think of what they're saying face to face. And imagine living that. It's the worst feeling in the world. And you're required to go to school, so then you're required to face it every single day. And some people aren't as lucky as I was. I don't know why I was able to stick it out. I really don't. Because I remember thinking that it would just be so much easier if I could just melt into the floor. Or if I just didn't come back to school tomorrow. I remember those thoughts. And now having met Tina Meyer, I just consider myself lucky that I made it this far. I really am. I'm lucky. Um, so now that you know my story, and why I'm doing this, and what karma is, and what it's about, I want to introduce to you Tina Meyer, who is now a national spokesperson. She is a friend of mine, and she this is her first time, like the mayor said, to the state of Alabama, and Apple's her first city. Um, I have talked to her many times and spoken very highly of Apple, so she is expecting a warm welcome. <laughs> so without further ado, Megan was an everyday kid, um, in elementary school, 
Megan even thought that there were times when she would you know, go out and play and, and be in elementary school, but come home to me and say, Mom, my legs are bigger than the other girl's legs. And I would say, Megan, you know, you're beautiful from inside and out. And, you know, thought when they were younger, you know, she'd kind of go home and it, she'd play it off and it wasn't a big deal. In third grade, Megan was crying a lot at night. And I thought it was just a kid who needed some more sleep. She was just exhausted, tired. So after a few weeks later, when she still went to bed early and she was still crying, she came to me um, one afternoon or that evening and said she wanted to kill herself. And for a parent of a third grader, I was horrified, petrified of why? Why do you feel this way? Um, we took Megan to the doctors the next day. I slept with her that night. And after a period of time, um, because it's not something that you can go get tested, you, can't, you can go get tested for diabetes, you can go get tested for many different diseases, but mental disease, any child who has any type of depression, any child who has attention deficit disorder, ADHD, it is a process, and it is a paper process. Um, after that period of time, Megan was diagnosed with depression and attention deficit disorder. We took her to counseling, we took her to psychiatrists to make sure that Megan was getting the help that she needed. Megan got through elementary school. Um, you know, the typical names were called in elementary school. It was, you know, you're too fat, you're too tall, you're too short, you're too skinny. You know, if you have red hair, you're carrot top. If you have braces, you're train tracks. If you have glasses, you're four eyes. And these are things that kids call each other every day. And I went through it when I was younger. But you would always tell your kids, listen, go tell somebody. Go talk to the teacher. And at that age, most of the time, they don't care that they're called the tattletale. Um, they just go tell. Um, but Megan entered middle school. And this is a time that is extremely hard for kids. It was sixth, seventh, and eighth grade. Sixth grade, Megan was the type of kid who got through um, school. But she was also the type of kid who I got called into the counselor's office several times. And the reason was because Megan was standing up for some other child. Um, so if somebody was getting made fun of, especially if they had a disability, or if for whatever reason they were being made fun of, Megan was the type of kid who ran over there, stood in the middle of it, and said, what are you doing? Why are you saying that? Don't say that. And she'd get called into the counselor's office. I, as a mom, was trying, I told her the complete wrong advice. I said to her, Megan, just please go to school. Please focus on your work. Stop focusing on everybody else around you. Just concentrate on that. Megan was doing the right thing. The things that way too many kids don't do. They don't stand up for others. They walk away, one, for the fear of they're going to be made fun of themselves. Two, that they're going to be ousted from that group um, for many different reasons. They don't think they're strong enough. But I told her the wrong advice. Seventh grade, Megan entered. Horrible pretty much from day one. Megan was um, stomped behind in the lunch line called a fat cow and an elephant to the point that Megan stopped eating lunch. She didn't come home and tell me about it. It's too embarrassing to come tell your parents that this is what kids are doing to you. Um, I found out because I snuck up at school one day while she was eating lunch and I sat there and watched her and she had a water bottle and a, bottle and a napkin. She came home that night and I said, Megan, what, why are you not eating lunch? And she said, Mom, they're calling me these names. Would you eat in front of them if they're calling you names? Kids found her in the gym locker, girls did, um, because in gym, this is a great place for people to make fun of somebody else. Um, you have to put on shorts and a t-shirt. Megan ran around, and kids called her thunder thighs. Um, I'm not sure if my earring is hitting this, so I'm taking it off. <laughs> I think it might be. Um, so kids called her thunder thighs to the point that Megan did not want to go to school anymore. I mean, she just cried every morning. She cried when she came home from school and said, I, I don't want to go back there, Mom. And I kept encouraging her, saying, come on, Megan, you can do this. You know, you are beautiful from the inside and out. What we all do as parents, we try to encourage them to keep them going and not letting them think that one failure can get them and make them go somewhere else. Megan then got this idea that if she fit in with a popular group, if she could fit in with them, then everything was going to be great. The boys weren't going to make fun of her. So she thought if she brought candy to them on Valentine's Day, if she was nice to them, if she did all of these things, tried acting like them, dressing like them, being like them, she was going to fit in. I kept explaining to her, Megan, you are who you are. You can't buy friends. But Megan thought, you know, you're just a mom. You don't understand. She said, you know, you don't go to school, mom. You don't know what it's like. 
So after a period of time where I couldn't take it anymore, watching this child come home from school crying, going to school in the morning crying, trying to fit in, we decided to switch her to a private school for eighth grade. Not because we thought a private school was going to have no bullying, because it was going to be better. We thought a change needed to be made. Um, it was no makeup, no fingernail polish, no jewelry, and a uniform. And I thought makeup was going to have a complete fit. Um, but I think in the end, it was more of a relief. She got to put the same clothes on every day, pretty much fit into where everybody else fit in at. The only difference was she wore a black and white polka dot ribbon in her hair. And that is the kind of stand for our foundation. <coughs> Um, because Megan loved black and white polka dots. In between the seventh and eighth grade year in the summer, <laughs> Megan started working out on her own. Um, she started looking at herself differently, and things were going positive. She um, started a volleyball team and made new friends. Eighth grade, she got into there, the new school, and this child was almost like a different kid. <coughs> Happy, excited, friends, and I thought as a parent, my gosh, we figured this out, this was it. But she asked for a MySpace account. She was going to be 14. And she's like, Mom, please, everybody has one. And I wasn't thrilled with MySpace. And the reason was because about six to eight months prior, Megan and her friend that lived down the street had made up a fake MySpace. I had no clue about it because kids make up MySpaces all day long without parents knowing. You just need an email address. doesn't have to be real. And all you have to do is put your information on there. They can make five and six up at a time. You don't have a clue. So Megan and her friend made this up, and they put a picture of a girl on there that they envisioned was beautiful. They thought they didn't know who she was, but they put this up to talk to boys. And when I found out about it, because Megan spent the night at a family member's house and they did a history search, they called me, and I was panicked as a mom. You know, I've watched the How to Catch a Predators in the 2020s, and you watch all of those, and you see all of these sexual predators out there. And I panicked. Oh, Megan, do you have any clue who you're talking to? Do you know? You know, these are strangers. These are sexual predators. Do you have a clue? And I asked her why she did it. Why did you put somebody else's picture in there? And she said, Mom, who is going to want to talk? What boy is going to want to talk to us? So obviously, I had her immediately close it down. But at this point, Megan had matured, and things were going much better. And I said, okay, here's the deal. You can have a MySpace account, but here are the rules. And usually when I tell kids this, they start whispering in, um, in the assembly, and they're like, Thank goodness this woman was not my mother. The thing was, it had to be kept private. Um, I had to be in the room or her dad had to be in the room at all times when she was on the computer. Never a computer was allowed in the bedrooms. Um, we had a program which was called WatchRight, which monitored every instant message and every website that Megan visited. Um, I, had to, I had her password. Her dad and I were the only ones that had her password. Megan did not have her password. And I had to prove the pictures and everything that went on her layout. And the reason was, was because I had started looking at kids' pictures and started looking at their layouts, and I saw girls that were from fifth grade on up, and it's usually the middle school girls that are pretty much the worst as far as not understanding what they're doing. In string bikinis, in boy shorts, bending over with their cleavage, um, doing anything they can do, putting blingy icons on their pages um, with Playboy Bunny icons. Any type of sexual seduction that they can do to get the attention of the boys. The boys put on, you know, lifted up their shirts, showed their abs for their profile picture, and then they would put their profile layout, usually as a fast car with a half-naked model, laying on them. And I told Megan, no way, I'm approving everything that goes on this page. And as a parent, I thought I had this pretty much gridlock. There was no way. So Megan started talking on this. It was about two weeks. Things were great. She was at her friends. Everything was still great. And she got a request from a boy named Josh Evans. And she looked at him. She's like, oh my gosh, Mom, come look at him. And I said, Megan, who is it? She said, I don't know. He's hot. I said, well, that's great, Megan. I'm so glad he's hot. But is he a friend of a friend? You know, do you know him? She's like, no, Mom, he's hot. So can I please add him? And I'm like, Megan, listen, you can add him. But anything negative, anything sexual, and he's deleted immediately. She said, okay, I promise. And this is a question that I ask because, believe me, through the past two years um, that I have gone out and spent talking, I will get parents that will say, why did you let your daughter add somebody that she didn't know? Why would you do that? You know, that's, you're asking for trouble. In any assembly, I don't care what area I go, what state I go, what income level it is, I will ask the students, 
if your parent was standing there and there was a hot girl or a hot guy that you wanted to add, and your parents said, no, forget it. When they walk away, or you go to your friends, or you go to the library, and you have that computer, what are you going to do? Add them. And that's what they're going to do. So I thought under my watchful eye with Megan, with all of the things in place, that this was going to be a piece of cake. I would know everything that was said. Five weeks, this boy said to Megan, she was beautiful, had beautiful eyes, took beautiful pictures, um, you know, how great she was. They talked about different things. And I was the parent that always said, you know, you do not give your school, you do not give the, the mall that you're going to be going to shop at. You don't give any of this information, nothing. I even called the police because, you know, sometimes as parents we have instincts. And I called the police to find out, can I find out if this MySpace account is real or not? They put me through the Cyber Crimes Division. There was, unless there, there are more accounts open on MySpace than there are people alive on Earth. That is not even the number one social networking site any longer. There is no way that they're going to go trace to find out if just a mom thinks that a MySpace account maybe is fake and wants to know. They don't have the time or the resources to do those. If there's a, a threat or a credible threat or they think it's an adult, they'll act on those things. So, after this period of time, everything was great. Megan was playing on her 14th birthday. And Sunday night, she had filled out, because she wanted them perfect, she filled out two sets of birthday invitations, because she was so excited. And she went and bought this black and white polka dot dress for her party, and she was going to have her first boy and girl party since, like, she was in third grade. You know, I didn't let her have them, and now she was like, finally, Mom, finally, you're not being so strict. So, it was that night, and Megan got on and signed her on, and she got this message from Josh that said, you're not a nice person, I don't want to be friends with you anymore. Megan was confused, and I said, Megan, well, she's like, Mom, what do you think this is about? And I said, well, Megan, I don't have a clue. You know, ask him what he's talking about. Maybe he's having a bad day. Maybe he found out wrong information. So she asked him, what are you talking about? And there was no response. Um, I told her it was time to go to bed. The next day was Monday, October 16th, 2006, and Megan was all excited to go to school. Um, they handed out her invitations. On the way, she had me stop at the gas station to pick up her friend at Hershey's Candy Bar, because anytime one of her friends were sad or upset about a boy or girl, parents, you, who knows what it was, she would get them a Hershey's Candy Bar to cheer them up. So we did. I picked her up from school that afternoon, and Megan came out of school. It was pouring down raining. That kid must have hit every puddle possible, run into the car, all excited, happy, everybody was coming to her party. So we get home that afternoon, and the second we get home, though, she wants to get onto MySpace to find out what Josh's response was. And I said, you know, you have a few minutes, because I've got to take your sister to the orthodontist. So she signed on, and the message from Josh was, you heard me, you're not a nice person, no one wants to be friends with you anymore. And Megan responded back with, what are you talking about? Where did you get this from? Why? And Josh's response, they went back and forth, and he said, no one likes you, no one wants to be your friends. And I said, Megan, you listen, I've got to go. Time to sign off. Her dad was upstairs sleeping, and she said, okay, Mom, please let me finish this last message, and I promise I'll get off. I said, okay. So I got her sister, and we went to the orthodontist. It was about half an hour later, and I called to check on her. And Megan was crying. I said, Megan, what's going on? And she said, Mom, they're saying horrible things. They're being mean. I said, who? What are you talking about? And she said, on MySpace. And I said, Megan, you're still on MySpace? Please get off now. You know the rules. She said, okay, fine, Mom. So a half an hour later, I called her again to check on her. I was getting ready to leave. And she was sobbing at this point, to the point that I could hardly understand her. And I said, Megan, what is going on now? And she said, Mom, I can't even explain it to you. You're going to have to come home and see it for yourself. And I said, are you still on MySpace? And she said, yes. I said, Megan, please get off the MySpace. I will deal with this when we get home. So I went home, and as a parent, it's one of those things. You're running around, you're trying to take one to the orthodontist, it's pouring down rain, you know that she didn't listen to what you were supposed to say, and I was frustrated with her. So I got home, her sister ran across the street, and I went downstairs and looked at the computers, and I started seeing the messages going back and forth from Josh to Megan, now Megan to Josh, and now two other uh, girls were involved that Josh had gotten in. And the nicest of the things that I can say um, we have children in here. There are vulgar, horrible, demeaning things that were going back and forth. Not just you're not a nice person, we don't want to be friends with you anymore. The nicest thing I can say is that these are on MySpace at the time. Um, they're still on there, but there were comments and there were bulletins. Comments can go out to any friend that is on your page. 
Bulletins go out to anybody that's on your page, and then they're forwarded to everybody else that's your friend. They can go out to their pages. So they can go out to hundreds of kids, if not thousands, within minutes. And the nicest were Megan Myers a whore and Megan Myers a fat ass. And those were the nicest things that went out. And I said to Megan, I said, Megan, you're not those things you're, they're calling you. If you would have listened to me, if you would have stopped and gotten off the computer when I told you to, this wouldn't have been this way. But now you're calling them names, I don't approve of that. They're calling you names, and now it's this just huge mess. And she said, Mom, who's going to believe me? No one's going to believe me. They're going to all believe them. She said, Mom, it went to my old school, now it's going to my new school. I said, Megan, you still knew better. You were supposed to have signed off. And she looked at me and said, you're supposed to be my mom. You're supposed to be on my side. And took off crying upstairs to her room. I looked a few minutes more, and then I heard her dad um, talk to her and then come downstairs into the kitchen. I went up to talk to him to find out, you know, what was going on. He wanted to know what was going on, and I explained to him why Megan was on the computer when she wasn't supposed to be. And it was probably 20 minutes later, and I just got this horrible feeling in my stomach. And I took off running upstairs to Megan's room, and I found her hanging in her closet. And as a parent, there's no words to describe. It tears your heart from the inside out, and it's never repairable, ever. We called 911. Um, unfortunately, her 10 and a half year old sister came home in the middle of seeing her dad and I screaming for her to breathe. Megan was transported to Children's Hospital. Um, 24 hours later, on October 17th, 2006, Megan passed away. And you hold your child as they come into life, and then you hold them as they take their last breath out. And it's something a parent should never have to go through. We went home that night to try to find Josh Evans and try to find these two girls because at that point in time, it wasn't about saying you're to blame. It was about letting them know that words hurt. The things you say to somebody else have devastating effects. And so we wanted to let them know, listen, we don't blame you for making stuff, but what we do want is we want you to take this now. Take this and pass it on to other people. When you see people saying mean things to somebody's face, you see them spreading these things on the computer and cyberbullying somebody else, let them know. Stop for just two seconds and let them know about it. But the Josh Evans account was deleted. It was gone. Um, the last two messages that we saw on there were the world would be a better place without you and have a shitty rest of your life. Those are the last two messages that Megan had seen that I didn't see. The two girls, I talked to them. I told them I didn't blame them for Megan's death. I asked them to just do positive things. Uh, these two girls were called murderers and killers in their school. They both had to get counseling because of dealing with what happened. About five weeks later, we were trying to get through the whatever so-called life we had at that point. And we got a call. Um, the call was from a neighbor down the street. I didn't know her very well at all. But she said it was an important meeting that we needed to attend about Megan's stuff. And I'm thinking, what are you talking about? What else could there be? So we went to the meeting. And at the meeting, we were informed that the Josh Evans account never existed. There was never a boy. Um, it was really a mom who lived four houses down the street from us. Um, a 46-year-old mother, her 13-year-old daughter, and an 18-year-old girl who worked out of her house part-time. They created this MySpace account, put a picture of a boy on there to get to Megan. And the whole reason was they had thought or heard that Megan and this girl had been friends since the fourth grade. Megan spent the night at their house. She spent the night at our house. Megan went on vacations with this family. And between the seventh and eighth grade summer, their friendship had really kind of split. Nothing major had happened. They just kind of went their own ways. But the parents had heard that Megan had called their daughter a lesbian. So their way to find out was to create a MySpace account, gain Megan's confidence, and find out if she was talking about her daughter behind her back. For five weeks, they kept this up. And Megan was not talking about her daughter behind her back. Megan very well could have said the word that she was a lesbian. But as a parent and an adult, you usually go to the parents and the adults. You don't go and attack a child. Uh, these people, I explained to kids, these people, when we found out about it, were the same people who came to Megan's wake and funeral and told us how sorry they were for Megan's death. And I explained to kids, 
At the end of the day, when you go home and you have your cell phone and you have your computer and you have your group of friends that are on there or people that you think you know, I don't care if it's an aunt, an uncle, your mom, your dad, a friend. At the end of the day, it is a phone with a screen. It is a computer with a screen. That is it. It is somebody's name. It's somebody that you think you know, but many times people's accounts get hacked into. Many times kids give their passwords away. You don't truly know who you're talking to unless you are face to face with that person. And so when you think you know somebody and you're giving out all of this personal information, and there's something that's going on, you need to call the person on the phone. If it's a friend, you call them. <coughs> After that, we went to Missouri did not have laws. A lot of people want to know what happened. Missouri didn't have laws, so in the state of Missouri, nothing was done with the lady. Um, we did later get the laws passed, thank goodness, um, because they need to be there. Laws are extremely important. doesn't mean it's going to stop everybody from doing this. It doesn't mean that you're going to stop a, a person from drinking and driving, even though there are laws in place. But there are many people who decide, you know what, it's not worth the risk, forget it. And we do have laws for internet harassment and internet stalking. And many people have a, a different opinion about it. Some people will say, you know what, it's freedom of speech. I absolutely believe people are incorrupt. We all have the right, we all have the freedom to speak our minds, but when you use that freedom, and you speak and you start sending messages that are hurtful, mean, demeaning about somebody, then your freedom of speech is gone. And that's truly where I believe it's at. And we have to have laws in place because unfortunately, not everybody believes that. Every, but some people believe that they have the right to say mean, cruel things, post people's pictures, post their phone numbers, post their information, whatever it is about them, and they think they have the right to put it out there. Because they can be anonymous. They can hide behind that computer and say whatever they want. And that stuff has to stop because it's affecting our children. It's affecting adults today. Um, we went to a trial, a federal trial in Los Angeles because MySpace is based out of Los Angeles. She was convicted on three accounts. Um, but the judge, unfortunately, threw the case out. And the reason he threw it out was because he felt that many people get on social networking sites and they click a terms of service button. It's a button that says, I agree to all the terms on the site. Many people get on there and they lie about their age, they lie about their name, where they work, they don't tell all the truthful, you know, all the exact information. Which we tell our kids, you don't put that you live in Prattville, Alabama. You put that you live in Zimbabwe, Hawaii. I don't care where you put, you just don't put the city. We do that to try to protect our kids, but his, his idea was that it would be unconstitutional to convict this woman because other people lie on the internet. That is a complete wrong message to send out, and I would stand here and tell him that today because you're giving people the ability to hide behind a computer to harass, humiliate, and stalk other people. As parents, I will truly say to you the things that you can do to help your children because if you're a parent or guardian or an official that's sitting here today and we have that same thought of, you know what, boys are going to be boys, girls are going to be girls, so you know, girls get in cat fights, and so boys knock each other around. That is not the world we live in today. Maybe it was great when I was back in school, and I would come home from school and you'd get called, I got called a whale in school, I got called names, of course, but you could come home. And you didn't have to deal with what the life is of these kids today. It is in school. It is happening in school. They can't control all of the phones that go in these schools. There's no possible way. Kids hide them in their pockets. They're not supposed to have them on during the day. I'm not sure what the school's rules are here. But kids have the ability to have them. Many kids have internet access on their phones. So that gives them the ability to take a video of a kid that they think maybe looks like a freak that's in the corner of the lunchroom that's eating, that maybe is a little bit overweight, and they think it's funny. And they have the ability to take a video of that person. Now they can take that, upload it on YouTube with music and sounds, crunching and pig noises, and then they can put it up there. And then they pass that to everybody in the school so they can make sure everybody knows about it. So now this kid leaves school, they go home, they start getting the messages, start seeing the posts, and this is what they live. So the boys being boys and the girls just having cat fights is no longer anymore. We have to, as parents, talk to our kids. We have to know where they're going, what they're doing. Internet access, 
You need to know what they're doing. Just saying, you know what, I trust my kid. That's great. We all have a certain amount of trust in our children, but children are vulnerable. And if we don't get on the computer and know what they're doing, who they're talking to, it is no different I've explained to people. When they said, you know, I trust my kids. You know, it's not a big deal. They have a computer in their bedroom. I trust them. They're smart kids. Okay, so if a 50-year-old man knocked on the door of your daughter, and she's 14, 16 years old, came to the door and knocked and said, you know, I want to see your daughter, would you let that person in? Would you let me come to speak to your 14-year-old son if you had no clue who I was, just knock on the door and let me right in to talk to him? If you wouldn't do that, then you will pay attention to what they're doing on a computer because the entire world is in their bedrooms, is in their living rooms, and that's what we're allowing to happen. We need to get parental controls. You need to talk to your kids and let them know what's out there. If you have younger children, you absolutely need to have filters. You need to have the parental controls on these. You need to have software that knows what they're doing. A lot of parents will say, let's an invasion of my kid's privacy. Really? Well, everybody's household has different opinions. Invasion of privacy to me is, now with the way they communicate through texting, through the internet, through all of that, if I had a neighbor who came down the street and said, you know what, the neighbor over here is going to be buying the kids a cake, they're going to have a party, everything's going to be great, they're 16 years old, it's not a big deal. Would you do something to stop it? Absolutely. But that is if we found out about it. We don't know about these things unless we figure out what's going on with our kids. Talking to them, putting the filters on. If your child is going through these situations at school and they're getting bullied consistently, they're being cyberbullied in school, you have to continue to fight because these children cannot put up a fight anymore. Some children can have, have coping mechanisms that can handle it. Other children don't have the coping mechanisms to handle it. Because a child has depression or ADD does not mean that these children are mentally retarded. It is no different than a child having any type of a disease. Sometimes these children can still handle it, but when you have any type of a mental disease on top of it, it is harder for them to cope with it and deal with it. So I pray that you go back, you talk to your kids, you find out what's going on on the computers, and they're going to throw a fit. They're going to absolutely have a heart attack if you take that phone from them and start looking at their text messages, start figuring out what's going on. But I will tell you that AT&T, many different subscribers have abilities for you to be able to get picture messages before your child does. So if you're going to give them that access and give them that ability to have it, you need to make sure that you know what the heck is going on. And they're going to throw a fit and say it's not fair, but bottom line is who pays the bill? We as parents pay the bill. You want it? My rules. You don't, you don't get it. Too bad. We have to start taking back ours instead of letting our children rule our lives. And I've got a, another child at home that's going to be 14, and believe me, she's on fire. She will fight me at every single corner, but bottom line is... Until you go out and get your own job, I'm looking at what's going on. I have that right for that cell phone. I have that right for that internet. If you don't like it too bad, don't use it. She probably calls me names behind my back, but, you know, that's okay. <laughs> um, so, again, at the end, I really want to thank Jessica and her mom and everybody for inviting me here. I think it is so important what she is doing. And with Karma um, talking about helping these kids, it's an amazing thing. It's something that we all need. We truly need somebody to take on this mission to kind of help us. And I appreciate you sitting here and taking the time to listen to me, so thank you very much. I think we have a quick video from the Dr. Phil show. Again, it just gives more of a visual from me talking. may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. Well, what if hurtful words were posted on the internet for the entire world to see and never erased? It's being called e-vengeance, bully side, or cyberbullying, and it is on the rise and out of control. In the old days, bullies attacked on the playground, now they attack online. Cyberbullying is a growing menace, which schools have trouble controlling. On this message board, kids write about who they hate, or who they think is pregnant, or has an STD. John Elegant believes depression from cyberbullying contributed to his son's suicide at age 13. 
percent of girls said they had bullied someone online. She does like all their whores and sluts and hoes. I have like 300 emails saying that I was a whore and everything. Cyberspace is the new venue for the schoolyard bully. Well, it's a story that's made national headlines. 13-year-old Megan Meyer committed suicide after being bullied online by who she thought was a teenage boy. But little did her parents know at the time that the bullying actually involved their adult neighbor who lived just four doors down. And the whole thing, the whole person she was talking to on the website was a hoax. It was a made-up person. Take a look. On October 16th of 2006, my daughter Megan hanged herself in her bedroom. Megan was 13 years old. Megan had a MySpace account, and she had become friends with a boy named Josh Evans and corresponded for roughly four to six weeks. Megan received a message from Josh Evans stating that he did not want to be friends with Megan any longer, that he heard she was not a very nice person. Megan was absolutely giving Bob Marley these insults. She's a mom, you know, they're just being mean to me online. I was aggravated, so I had my voice raised with her. You knew better than to say in the MySpace. You knew the rules. She was really upset, and I said, Megan, I am really disappointed with you. And she said, you're supposed to be my mom. You're supposed to be on my side. And she took off running upstairs. And those are the last words that she sent to me. Tina came into the kitchen when we were talking about basically why I was Megan on the computer. Then all of a sudden my heart just dropped. I just had this horrible feeling. I turned around and took off from the stairs. I heard this god awful scream. I ran upstairs in Megan's room and she was hanging in her coffin. I grabbed Megan in one arm. She had a belt around her neck and it was really tight and I couldn't get it off. So I grabbed Megan and picked her up with one arm and then I grabbed the whole closet organizer with the other arm and ripped it all out of the wall to get her down. Tina called 911. So 
what we're going to do is we have a question. If you'll stand, we'll get the runner to take the mic over there, and I'll sort of point and direct, and uh, we'll do the best we can to cover the balcony hands down here. Anybody has a, anybody has a question?
the little PS2 games that you have that you know you see kids playing, those are interactive within 50 feet. So if your kids are playing that and they're in an airport, they're at school, there was a girl who was, a mom came up to me, they were in bread company, and her daughter was on there and she got a message, I really like that dress you're in. Somebody in the bread company had sent this to this little girl. So if you're going to give the kids the technology, bottom line, whatever it is, you need to make sure you know what the heck you're giving them. And you need to make sure you're putting in restrictions on anything that they've got.